We are live. Welcome to Jessica Jones Season 1 Thoughts. So, like with Daredevil, I absolutely loved the entire season. I'm not going to mention every single thing that I loved. Yeah, just, yeah. Every scene, all the characters, you know, you got such great character moments, impeccable acting, strong writing. Let's see. Yeah, and the, the tension and the, the stories, just, yeah. I, when I did the Daredevil Season 1 video, I accidentally messed up, I know, nobody but me cares about this, but just to clarify, yeah. I thought that Luke Cage Season 1 premiered before Daredevil Season 2, and yeah, so... Next up will be Daredevil Season 2, not Luke Cage Season 1. So, yeah. Spoilers for MCU leading up to and including the season, but nothing released after this. None of the movies after this. I haven't watched the, the rest of the Netflix shows yet. So, yeah. The, the next Netflix shows will be Daredevil Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Iron Fist Season 1, Defenders... Punisher Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, Luke Cage Season 2, Iron Fist Season 2, Daredevil Season 3, The Punisher Season 2, and finally Jessica Jones Season 3. That is the order I will be going in. That is the order in which they all premiered. And yeah, this video will be shorter than my usual full season thoughts video because of my back pain. And let's see. Yeah, so the following are not criticisms of Daredevil. They're observations. I love... Daredevil Season 1 and Jessica Jones Season 1 equally. So yeah, Daredevil Season 1 is about the good guys who already know there is a really bad organized crime in... Not A, but yeah, really bad organized crime in the city, figuring out who is behind the organized crime, and the bad guys try to increase their power and influence, including betraying each other. And let's see... So, so yeah, you know... This season, Season 1 of Jessica Jones... She she finds out in the pilot that Kilgrave isn't dead, and yeah, you know, she's trying to figure out exactly how to defeat him, and the, the, ah, what's the word? How to defeat him because of the... The superpowers. And I just realized I did not start the timer. I'll uh, just real quick and uh, there we go. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, trying to figure out how to defeat Kilgrave and figure out where he is, but not like exactly who, you know, she knows from the start who. The, the big threat is. I thought, based on the pilot, that there would be more of Jessica solving cases. Ultimately, there isn't that much of that. I think it works that there's, you know, th there also weren't that many uh, lawsuits that, you know, Matt and Foggy dealt with in season one of Daredevil. And. Yeah, and she, you know, Jessica does not use her powers that much to defeat people. A lot of the time, like, you know, she in in the pilot she intimidates someone and yeah, a lot of the time like she's breaking down locks and such because she does not consider herself a hero. Whereas Matt, like he's also he he has some self-doubt but he'd like to think that he's changing the world for a better place, you know. And over the course of this season, you understand why Jessica stopped doing that. It was how she met Kilgrave. And he made her do awful things. And, like, you know, she maybe thinks, well, if I do good things, that can make up for the awful things. But, you know, yeah, she chose to be a private investigator instead, which... I mean, some of the work they do is good, for sure, but it's not the same as being a hero. 
And yeah, both Jessica and Matt are isolated, alone, find it hard to relate to other people, and it's because of something bad that happened to them that changed them seemingly forever and gave them, you know, ability. Yeah, abilities. He doesn't have super strength, she does, but he has the, the special vision. And Daredevil beats up criminals, working his way up the food chain, where Jessica Jones watches people and uncovers truths. I really appreciate that they're so different. It would have been so unbelievably boring if this was just Jessica Jones going around beating up people, because it's, it's also just too obvious, you know, okay, she has super strength, so she punches people a lot, you know, like, I, I heard some critics say that the, the fight choreography was bad, because Jessica just pushes people, and, I mean, I, I guess I get where they're coming from, but this isn't really an action show, at least not this season, yeah, the, the, but yeah, she, she pushes people, and throws them and such. But there are a lot of episodes with no action scenes at all in, in this season. And yeah, I really appreciate that. I I think the MCU can handle shows that don't have a lot of action. I'm not sure we're ever going to get a movie that doesn't have a lot of action from the MCU. But yeah. I, I personally don't think that Eternals needed as much action as it had that the the action might have been my least favorite of the of the movie. I thought I I found it deeply compelling the way it slowly Is that a spoiler cuz it did come out after I guess I'm going to yeah. You know, I did a review on it if you want my specific thoughts on it. Now, the yeah, so that brings us to the first episode. And it is titled, AKA Ladies Night. And here we go. So yeah, I love the noir style right away. Even just the intro sequence, narrations, shadows, silhouettes, the music. I really love her cynicism, which she would call realism. And Jessica calls while on the can. I feel like that's, and, and I know it's also in the comic, that's what this show is. She is relatable and she's just a human being. You know, she's not a sex object and I really appreciate that. There are few things as unsexy as someone being on the toilet, you know. Unless you're into that, in which case that's perfectly fine. But yeah, that's that's very humanizing. And she also, like, she wears normal people clothes. You know, she's not running around in a suit that really highlights her physique or something. And I th really, I thought she did a great job while calling on the can, pretending to be someone, like, she plays the role perfectly you know, and gets information. Let's see, in the first episode, yeah, that it's she calls and claims she's working for this company, and she, you know, she relates to the person she called because the the person she's calling is like, you know, used to be in a, a the female version of a fraternity. What is that again? Sorority, that's it. She was in a sorority, and she claimed, you know, Jessica claims to also be a member of that sorority, so there's immediately some level of trust there. And she says, oh, I can't read his handwriting. Oh, no, he's coming back, and he's already mad at me. He, oh, I don't want to get fired. And so the other, the other person is like, oh, do you mean this? And yeah. And Jessica can't sleep, so she goes out to get some work done. I love that part of her process is filling a thermos with, I'm pretty sure it's vodka. I'm 100% certain it's not beer. It's it definitely some kind of hard liquor. And she looks at people through their windows. Not a big fan of the fat shaming and kink shame. I, I don't know. I guess it is Jessica. It's not necessarily the episode saying that that's how we should feel. I realize that, but 
I don't know, actually come to think of it, maybe it is supposed to say this is this is Jessica. She she watches people and she judges them. Actually, yeah, that 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 works. Fair enough. And you know, she she imagines Kilgrave right next to her saying, "You want to do it, you know you do." And she comes to repeating a list of of streets and you know later it's explained this is how she recovers from the triggering of her PTSD repeating the street names from when she grew up and let's see. yeah and she gets clients and you know they're they're the parents of hope and the father bob keeps trying to fix the door like you know he he just really badly wants to help this young woman and it's probably a way to not worry too much about his own daughter and she talks to the roommate the artist who replaced hope let's see i that he was wow that oh it's, it has to be one unbroken shot i there can't be any cuts there was a cut I don't get the sense that Spheres gets very many lifts, so Jessica sees fit to give him one. I can melt your face with my laser beam eyes. And Jessica talks to Jerry, and we see some brief gentle kissing between her and uh, uh, Pam, the secretary, and we realize, you know, yeah, she's cheating on her wife with this other girl, and, you know, I mean, lesbians can cheat too, that happens. So far, there hasn't been any indication that Jerry is bi. I hope it doesn't turn out that in season two or three, it's such a nasty stereotype that bisexuals cheat. Let me see. And it also, you know, at first it looks like Luke is cheating on his wife, and and you know but he it's real that he doesn't know the woman he's with is married and his wife is is dead he's a he's a widower so it's not yeah and you know he clearly he doesn't the moment he finds out that it's cheat that that he was helping this woman cheat he shuts her down completely so you know cuz that's also there's also a really ugly stereotype about black men having sex intentionally you know helping white women cheat Let's see. and you know Luke tells her it's ladies night and she feels it's too good to be true something she probably feels very frequently and uh, what was uh, I wanted to say the um, yeah I mean it's the episode title I guess she doesn't have that level of awareness I'm joking. I really love the conversations between Jesse and Luke, and they have casual sex, and we later find out, you know, she's... She wants to help him heal, and she... Yeah. And let's see... Yeah, and Jessica sees Luke's picture of his dead wife, setting that up. And she wakes up from another PTS night nightmare, imagining Kilgrave licking her face. And yeah, this is a very realistic depiction of PTSD. And Jessica realizes Hope was with Kilgrave in the restaurant, like when they were together. Even though it's the the you know it has now changed, and she struggles to complete the PTSD coping mechanism. And. And Jessica goes, you know, f first she tries contacting Jerry for money, and Jerry is like, that's not how this works. And so Jessica, you know, goes to, to Trish and, you know, asks her for the money, and Trish points out how messed up it is that she hasn't heard from her for so long. And I, I really like, you know, Jessica knows that the the hotel is um where 
you know, she expects Kilgrave to be there, so she pulls the fire alarm so Kilgrave can't hurt anybody else and finds Hope in the bed with the mind control compelling her to stay. And Jessica gets Hope to use the street names like she herself is, gets her to say out loud that it isn't her fault. And, you know, the the when, when she talked to Trish, we found out that that's where she got the... Ah, what's it called? She, let's see, she paid for a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist told her to repeat the street names. And I'm pretty sure Jessica doesn't admit to Trish that she is using it. You know, so, yeah, she she's she struggles to let her guard down. I honestly really did think that the, you know, Hope and her parents would be okay once they're in the elevator, but Kilgrave's control compels her to shoot her parents. And, you know, once she has, she breaks down, and at first Jessica feels like she just can't do this again, and... We had some narration, some of our narration from the start, that once you know, you can either deny it, or you can do something about it, so she goes back. Excellent pilot, really want to know more about Jessica Kilgrave, Hope, and the other major characters. And, yeah, hoping the next episode will dig deeper into what Kilgrave did to Jessica and what will happen to Hope now. They really made us care about Hope's parents. They made them distinct people before killing them off so that it would hit us and Jessica harder. And that brings us to the second episode, a.k.a. Crush Syndrome. And... Yeah, you know, the, the cop knows that Jess isn't saying everything. And the cop claims Luke is involved with Hope and gave her a gun. I didn't think so. Love seeing a fellow civilian know her rights. Great conversation between Jessica and Luke. She tries to explain, he doesn't give. And and Jessica goes to talk to Hope, and it's hard for Hope to get words out. And a lot of what she says is basically what Kevin wants her to say, made her say. Let's see. And the, yeah, the, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and the, I think that's the scene where Hope tells, you know, yeah, she says to Jessica, this isn't my fault. It's yours. You should have killed him. And Jessica convinces Jerry to represent Hope. And there's that excellent line, I'm not safe anywhere. I can't trust anyone. These are very common for people with trauma, PTSD, rape survivors. And before I say more about trauma, please know if you have experienced trauma and you are not responding this way, the way that this show and others say it's common, that does not mean that there is something wrong with you. Everyone processes pain in their own way. And just takes on an alias. Does she do one per episode? I think she might do at least one per episode, which is very alias of the show to do. And Trish sent someone to fix Jessica's door, but she thought he was there to attack her. You know, Trish figured, you know, someone has to be sent to fix that door. And Jessica can't imagine that that's that. Like, you know, we understand why she doesn't, like, say, you know, identify yourself. What's going on here? Because if it's someone sent by Kilgrave, that, you know, she needs to get the, the drop on them. You know, and, and they talk, to Jessica and Trish talk, and Jessica is like, I'm going to handle it. And Trish points out, no, you won't, because she knows her. And on the train, Jessica has a PTS flashback, PTSD flashback, thinking he's right next to her. So she elbows the window. Everyone's staring at her. She's the coping mechanism. Very accurate, very sympathetic depiction of PTSD. You know, I think a lot of people, 
either witnessed by themselves or have heard a personal account of someone and they maybe didn't know that it was PTSD and they you know they just saw someone behaving strangely and i feel like shows like this can help you know help us all realize what PTSD is how hard it is to to cope with and you know the next time you see someone behaving strangely it might be trauma And, you know, Jack's mom thinks Jess works for the government and Jess pretends to claim she can change the ruling for info. So she, you know, she isn't above some very questionable methods. And, yeah, we find out that Kilgrave survived, was thrown in an ambulance, and took the driver's kidneys. And, you know, Jack... You know, he writes K-I-L, and Jessica thinks he's writing Kilgrave. So she asks, do you know where he is? And, you know, he he finishes writing, and he wrote, kill me. And she can't bring herself to, and trauma does make some people suicidal. You know, earlier when Hope said, you should kill yourself, to Jessica, she said, probably. You know, and then she continues... It, then she says, I'm the only one who can get you out of here. I'm the only other person who knows that, that Kilgrave did this to you. And yeah, and, and Luke could handle the rugby players on his own, but Jessica didn't know that and showed up. And Jessica has to chase down on foot. I, Dr. K is what I'm going with. Who performed the surgery, and Jessica finds out anesthesia is Kilgrave's yeah Kilgrave's weakness is anesthesia now I don't know if we should ask Mythesthesia or Anna will be more than happy to help and I don't know her I mean I'm sure if we ask she'll be more than happy to help out really bungled that anyway it wasn't that good of a joke to begin with the the you know, when she approached Dr. K, I did not think he was going to run off, you know, but yeah, he thinks Kilgrave sent her. And it is a, it's a very logical thing for him to think. And and later he, he like leaves the country to get away from Kilgrave. And yeah, I mean, who wouldn't in that circumstance, if, if you have the, if you have the money or connections to be able to, yeah. And Trish sent replacement glass, so Jessica calls her. There's some sisterly banter. And she, you know, she says, I, f I forget exactly, it's something like, you're, you're just like your mother, or something like that. And she responds, I'm nothing like my mother. And later we find out her mother was abusive. So, you know, when Jessica says that, it's actually like, you know, it's a, it's a personal thing, but it, it's a bit nasty of, of her to, to say, but that is kind of, you know, she can't really, she has trouble letting people in, you know. In the finale, Trish hugs Jessica, and it takes like a second or two before Jessica returns the hug. I think that's the first time in a long time that, you know, Trish wants to, but Jessica usually doesn't you know and and this time Trish so badly wanted to that she didn't wait for for Jessica to you know yeah and afterwards we see the exercising that's referred to was training to deal with someone coming at her with a gun which yeah you know and and do we know if she was doing that before she knew that Kilgrave was alive I guess that's probably, she had that set up as soon as she found out Kilgrave was still alive. That, yeah. And, you know, when, when she said exercise, Jessica thought, ah, oh, what was it, meditation or something? You know, she, or, or, no, can't have been meditate. That's not, no, no, not meditation, yoga. And then she said, yoga isn't exercise, it's meditation or something like that. 
and let's... yeah, and we see Kilgrave going to a new place, sending the kids to the classes. So we see yet another shade of his cruelty, and. I'm guessing he was originally intending to continue to stay in the hotel room with Hope. Now he has to find a different place. And let's see, th this was either him finally finding a place, or it's just the, the you know, he's been going between different places. Let's see, because, you know, in, in episode three, he's in another place. And the cockroach returns, and Jessica kills it for good this time. Because he's a metaphor for Kilgrave. Let's see. Yeah, so this episode followed up on Jerry cheating on Luke. You know, this is when Luke finds out that he was with a married woman and he's not okay with that. Let's see. Right, and Luke and Jessica talk about their superhuman strength and his durability. And we've got more background on Kilgrave and stuff that would not have fit in the episode before this one. We understand now how he survived, which was one of the big mysteries the pilot set up. And yeah, you know, that that is uh, the, the, what's it called? The, the, That is how the, the show goes, you know, Jessica works her way closer to Kilgrave. And in these episodes, we've seen several examples of Jessica's id, her repressed thoughts and desires coming to the surface of her conscious thought when she rests or dozes off. That by itself is not unhealthy, but the problem is that they are spoken to her, not in her own voice, but in Kilgrave's. He still has that much power over her, even though he hasn't spoken directly to her in a year, which is how he, you know, yeah, how he exerts his power over people. And sadly, this is accurate for many people who have been traumatized. To them, it can feel like no time has passed since the last contact with the person, since the last time that person traumatized them. It feels like they're still there causing pain. And it feels like they're... Ah, what's, like, like the things... Ah... Yeah, if you if you have been gaslighted, which is one of the another really big thing, you know. Yeah. She was gaslighted and now she's left feeling like if there is something, you know, in in the pilot she think, you know, yeah, deep down she does want to um what was it? It was it was something with like spying on people and did she want to con did she maybe want to talk to one of them? She wanted to talk to Luke after spying on him. That was it. And instead of her, you know, she is no longer the devil on her own shoulder. Kilgrave is. Because for so long, he made her feel like the things that she... The things that he wanted were things that she actually wanted. You know, so now, it, yeah, I thought that was a really excellent. So yeah, I still love Daredevil Season 1, and I was incredibly into the plot and characters, really looking forward to Season 2, but I think I actually care even more about this show. Let's see, the... There we go, and Episode 3... A.K.A. It's Called Whiskey. Apparently, originally, the show was supposed to be called A.K.A. Jessica Jones, and then they changed it to just Jessica Jones. Right. I I think part of it is that this whole... the Like, I... PTSD trauma and gaslighting are subjects that I'm very passionate about. And, you know, the... the there was definitely also trauma in Daredevil you know, Matt's trauma, the Russian brothers' trauma, Kingpin's trauma, but here it really just, the, the, I mean, here we really do have a, the, you know, the titular character, the protagonist is struggling with 
PTSD on a daily basis. So that, yeah. Jessica and Luke playfully fight for dominance, then have sex. And yeah, the, you know, for this entire season, the sex on the show is for characterization, for character growth, you know, plot points. I approve. It, it shows where people are, you know, emotionally. Like, there's that one scene where Trish, like, is, is more dominant with Simpson in bed. And, you know, that, that's where she is emotionally. So, so, yeah. I've seen some people say that there's too much sex on the show. I can't speak to season two, three, two, hand three yet, but so far, one heart, no, one hundred percent disagreed. They're entitled to their opinion, but I one hundred percent disagree with them. I think there's a, uh, sadly, to some people, sex in movie and TV, it's still just for titillation. And if that were the case, if if the sex on this show was just, you know. I, I remember seeing someone call it masturbation aid, which I think is a good way to put it. If the sex on the show was masturbation aid, I, I don't know. I suppose some people use that, and that's perfectly fine. But if that was the only thing, I agree that I, I wouldn't want that on this show. You know, wasn't a big fan of the the needless sexualization. In Daredevil season one, it's it's a not it's not a very big problem, but yeah, but I really the this show really uses it well and and shows that you can do more with sex scenes than just titillation. And more, I wasn't talking about food. A woman confident about sex, great, very healthy. And at the convenience store, the radio's on, people calling for hope to be punished at home podcast does, does the same. So, uh, you know, Jessica tries to get Jerry to make a statement. I really appreciate that the show tackles how important public perception is when it comes to trials. And and actually, you know, the, the finale has Jessica kill Kilgrave in front of, I don't know, a dozen or two witnesses and then she becomes known as this great hero which you know for one thing it wasn't quite that that wasn't something that she had anticipated or hoped for she just had to get rid of kilgrave but you know that that's also i figure season 2 will show more her trying to figure out how to you know, how much of a hero she wants to be after a season, you know, after, so let's see, yeah, she was a private eye for over a year when she thought Kilgrave was dead, and now she's certain Kilgrave is dead, so there's no, you know, like, hypothetically, if that was the main thing, maybe she will have an easier time being a hero now. And... And Jessica considers knocking out people for the drug, even the pregnant lady, you know, but then, you know, there's a cop, that's gonna, there's, you know, too much heat. And... Yeah, and, and the, um... Is it a radio show that they still... Anyway, Trish Talk, I think it's called. You know, Jessica tries to warn Trish, don't antagonize him, and then Kilgrave calls in, and the, you know, yeah, he sends Simpson. And, you know, Jessica manages to convince Trish to make an apology on the show, and Kilgrave accepts it. I appreciate the show is as ethnically diverse as New York really is. It's it's pretty ridiculous for 
there was a while when stories set in New York would mostly be white people, and it's like, have you ever been there? Like, I've, I haven't been there for very long. I was, I was there for 30 minutes, maybe, and I saw there's, there's a lot of ethnic diversity there. And that's one of the great things. That's one of the great things about the city. That's one of the great things about America in general. It really, it sucks all these pieces of fiction that refuse to acknowledge that. And then when they finally do, conservatives freak out. And Jessica takes Malcolm to the hospital to get the drug. She knocks him into another person, using him as a tool. And the look on his face when he realizes she used him, and possibly got him in trouble. Got the idea when. I want to say Reuben is his name, said everyone's a little racist, not only Robin. And Trish is not sure the cop is for real. And the, I, you know, Kilgrave can be very effective because what Simpson says makes sense. You know, like if Simpson was there on real police business, yeah, you know, it's, I, I know you're, you know, you're, you're this the host of this show and if you you know if you let me in if we we can handle this more quietly and you won't get bad press for the you know and and that was also like she thought that was someone working for Kilgrave attacking her and it's this thing of you know she's a celebrity I, I forget I think it was maybe what the flick one of them pointed out you know regular people feel entitled to you know walk right up to her and talk to her like they've known her this this crap what's it called again the parasocial relationship i want to say it's called i really appreciate the writing concerning trish that she did all of these things to protect herself and when jessica hears about it she asks if her mother is back you know that's why she was in foster care her mother was physically abusive when trish was a kid and we later see some of that and let's see. very tense fight between Trish and Simpson and Jessica shows up, injects Trish with the anesthetic to trick the cop into thinking she's dead. Very clever. And Jessica plants Trish's cell phone on the cop. So she can listen in and follow him. Very tense when she sees Kilgrave for the first time in a year with her own eyes. And let's see, it's not completely clear if he was still recovering from surgery until he went after Hope. Maybe he went after people who didn't end up like, ah, what's the word? I guess maybe the thing, yeah, probably Hope is just the first young woman that you know the parents were like seriously concerned you know it was the she, what was it she still called them every week but the mother felt there was something wrong i, f I forget yeah yeah she was like spending money that she, in a way that she didn't use yeah yeah she usually like they gave her a credit card in case of emergency but now she's using it and not telling them what is going on you know and the yeah yeah i think it's probably that all the all the women in that year were not yeah one of the things that is so repulsive about kilgrave as a villain is that he is completely obsessed with jessica and willing to act on that and that is one of the scariest things to a woman today you know the, the in in real life the the you know mind control isn't real but gaslighting is and yeah you know in real life it would be that it was like emotional manipulation that he used for you know what uh were they how long were they together eight months i think so yeah and you know afterwards he would become a stalker and we see that through kilgrave getting malcolm to take pictures of her all the time 
you know, when, when she finds the, the room full of, you know, all these pictures, yeah, that's extremely creepy. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and the cop tries to jump off the building. That's how Kilgrave takes care of loose ends. He knows that if he keeps pushing the cop... Yeah, yeah, if he keeps pushing the cop to that, Jessica will feel compelled to help. And we see Jessica was the one who killed Luke's wife, Reva, which is why she's been following him, because it wasn't the married woman's husband who got... Yeah. As painful as it can be to someone who's experienced tragedy, it is very natural for the people responsible, if they have empathy, to approach that person and try to make amends. And that's it's very difficult to, to tell someone, I am responsible for your pain. So I think she wanted to, but she couldn't quite get herself, you know, she is... She's very emotionally unavailable because of what Kilgrave did to her. It's it's incredibly, like, the emotional intelligence on display in this entire season is just incredible. Now... So. Yeah, we, we see that Kilgrave was you know is not in the same place as we saw him go into in episode th uh, two so, you know i can imagine he maybe doesn't stay long in any one place and yeah jessica finds the room where kilgrave looks at pictures of her very creepy and it just dawned on me as i was typing the, these notes the reason Hope, the athlete, could not jump as high as Jessica is because Jessica jumps with her superpowers. And Jessica tells the cop he jumped, so now he won't continue to try to do that like Kilgrave made him. And Jessica tells Luke they can't go on. We see that Kilgrave had a photo from when she took pictures of Luke, so he's been watching her recently. And that's also, you know, that means that Kilgrave either does at this point know or... Yeah, I think he finds out later. That, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. If she keeps being involved with Luke, Kilgrave might target him. And that's another thing. If, you, if there's a stalker, you might worry that they will go after people close to you, not only you. So, yeah, the third episode was the first episode to really have action scenes. They're good and plenty. And I wondered if that would be the norm for the rest of the season or not. I threw them down. Yeah. You know, it, uh, it doesn't really. There are a number of episodes with no action or... Yeah, I mean, there's no... There... I guess there are some long action scenes. Anyway... Episode 4, Thoughts, 99 Friends. And, yeah, we found, you know, Kilgrave got others to take pictures of Jessica, so he would be far away from her. Jessica helps Malcolm get into his apartment, and he's understandably upset with her. And... Yeah, Jessica thought maybe Audrey was the spy. Stalkers make you paranoid. And, you know, Simpson isn't there to kill Trish. He's there to... He thinks that he killed her, you know. And Jessica explains to the cop she knows how hard this is. She was in his place when she killed Reva. And let's see. Yeah, and, and Simpson agrees to help Jessica, giving her 30 hours of surveillance footage. 
and a lot of supposedly kill great people and only a few of them are legit and Simpson is paranoid too attacking Malcolm and at the end of the episode we realize he was right and that's a it's a nice little cuz yeah sometimes you know it was his instinct instincts as a cop and which you know in fiction yeah in real life a lot of the time it's just racism Let's see. so ultimately Jessica never used the support group she only used it for investigation purposes I I guess it's possible that she will down the line maybe the when she lets Trish hug her rather than backing away from it and returns the hug maybe that's her starting to yeah and maybe she'll just talk to Trish that I, I think that's more like her than talking to other people who have been kill raped Yeah, and and a Simpson got Trish a revolver and she points the gun at him through the door, but later the Yeah, I'll I'll get into that. Yeah, and, and Jessica follows Audrey's husband, whose name escaped me, and right next to a sign that says no sitting, loitering, standing, she super jumps. Sign didn't say anything about that. Audrey calls, sounding like Kilgrave got to her. Jessica claims to be bulletproof. Audrey calls her bluff. Which is also a good, like, the finale where she's shot at by a bunch of cops. It's important for us to know, no, 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 bullets do pierce her skin. And Audrey isn't there for about Kilgrave, she's upset about the Avengers, she lost her mom, and Jessica breaks everything in the room, says there are 99 gifted friends in this borough alone, tells them to disappear. I have to admit, based on the title, I thought 99 friends were like bottles of booze, or you know, 99 bottles of beer on the, yeah, some, something like that, you know. I wonder if the thing about the events of Avengers 1, the Chitauri invasion, I wonder if that's a thing on 9-11. I'm not sure I've heard people blaming the firefighters for the dead. It made me think, you know, maybe it's criticizing people who want police reform. So, yeah. If, if you watch every video of mine, I've gotten into this a lot lately. But, you know, I'm, yeah, in case you haven't. Thought Slime made an excellent video called All Cops Are Bad, and I'm going to quote some of it. The problem isn't with individual cops, it's policing as an institution. Abolish the police, replace them with something more egalitarian. Currently, the police are very resistant, having their behavior scrutinized. Their actions make it clear they want to get away with extrajudicial violence. The police protect the rich, not the poor. The system isn't broken. It is working it's made to keep the powerful in control. The police should be abolished, replaced by voluntary community self-defense. Thought Slime non-compete non both explain this in detail. We should focus on not on punishment, but on restitution, rehabilitation. We should prevent crimes instead of punishing them. And the best way to prevent crimes are social pr programs, UBI, making sure that people have access to education that allows them to get the job they want if possible. Obviously, I'm not asking for pre-crime thought crime, that kind of thing. And we see even all these hours later, Trish and the sergeant are still talking, even though she still hasn't let him in. And then she does let him in, trusting him now. It's very common for people who share trauma to try to process it together, including when one traumatized the other. And... Right, that is it for that episode. Which brings us to 
episode five. The sandwich saved me. So yeah, we see 18 months ago, she worked at a company. I like that the episode keeps cutting back to 18 months ago. And she extorts the guy she's working for. And that was, you know, she could have done her job. But instead, she, you know, she looked into him. And she, she made a ball out of rubber bands and throws it against the monitor. I mean, that's... It's not quite quiet quitting, because it's not quiet, but it's in that same ballpark. And Trish supports Jessica, very, which is very sweet. And Jessica says she'll play against the guy if he apologizes and leaves, if he loses, and uses her super strength to win. And it's so gross, he goes up to her saying like, oh yeah, I was 12, I masturbated to your show, and it's like... There's before Kilgrave and after Kilgrave. She's speaking about Malcolm, but it also fits herself. And she sees Kilgrave in person again. And she has the standard MCU disguise with a cap, although not the sunglasses. And I will say, it's kind of convenient writing that Simpson shows up on the show with a military past, access to a hermetically sealed room and such, you know, Kilgrave couldn't just get, you know, a, a cop that didn't have those. You know, mil military past isn't uncommon, you know, completely, but there are a number of cops who don't. And certainly access to a hermetically sealed room. I don't know, I just, I feel like... They could have had it be that Jessica realized we have to get a hermetically sealed room. And, uh, you know, she did some research to find a cop like that. Actually, yeah. Maybe even have it be that she actually, she found Simpson. And then she sent Simpson to a place where she thought Kilgrave would take her over, take him over, so that he would feel guilty and help, or something like that. I don't know, maybe it's a little too dark. But, yeah. And, you know, yeah, Jessica needs to get Hope out of prison, so she can't just kill Kilgrave, even though obviously she would like to. It... I don't love that they then later kill Hope. I, I think I'll talk about that when I get to that episode. And, you know, we see that Trish had sex with Simpson. Shared trauma can create strong bonds between people extremely fast. And I like that, you know, Simpson participates in the discussion about what to do about Kilgrave. And, you know, Jessica goes... Oh, it's, no, it seems okay. Jessica goes with Simpson to the hermetically sealed room. And both of them say things they'd like to say to the other while knowing about the soundproofing. And, you know, neither one wants to show weakness. And in the past, we see that Trish made a suit for Jessica. Really tense as they undertake the mission. That entire sequence was definitely the most I cared about anything in this or the first season of Daredevil. So far, keeping in mind, I'm not changing my mind on loving all of it and caring deeply about it. And it's really high up on the list of MCU stuff in general. And Jessica calls out to Kilgrave so that Simpson can shoot him. Because otherwise, Kilgrave would have stopped Simpson. Good fight when the company bodyguards catch up to the four of them. And yeah, of course, Kilgrave had bodyguards. It hit like a kick to the gut to see them lose Kilgrave. And, you know, we know, obviously, it'll be a lot harder to get close to Kilgrave now. And Simpson was going to cut the kneecap. Yikes. You know, in general, with the... Let's see. 
Yeah, with, with the one bodyguard captured and Trish gone, Simpson gets kind of intense, very daredevil. And... Yeah, we see in flashback Jessica saving Malcolm, meeting Kilgrave. This is why she runs a detective agency rather than going out and being a hero, even though she logically knows she's not going to run into Kilgrave or someone else awful every time she's a hero, but she just can't get herself to do it. It's triggering to her. And... and Kilgrave calls her and asks for a daily picture in exchange for Malcolm's safety and don't forget to smile and then the finale she he actually uses those pictures he, he puts them on the hospital monitors and, and screens and such and Malcolm threw the drugs in the toilet instead of taking them so he's agreeing to quit cold turkey and at the very end of the episode Jessica does send a picture and since he's too far away for it to be his power she did make that choice and he obviously loves being able to exert that power over her even without his powers so you know basically Kilgrave is a narcissist who hurts the people he has power over to satisfy his, his own urges basically what Trump was before he ran for office and countless other men so an extremely relevant depiction of evil to be clear no one is born evil there are evil deeds evil choices you know throughout the I, I, I'm not sure they really like spell out but basically Jessica also had pain when she was younger but she chose not to use it for evil you know so the the yeah he chooses to use it for evil to to satisfy his own urges and she you know she was a hero briefly and then you know now she's a private detective which i mean you could make the case that she is she is if nothing else she's catching people who cheat which you know i understand that there are reasons why people cheat but it is a really ugly thing. I've always said that if you feel like cheating on your partner, don't cheat. Tell your partner that that's how you feel and then the two of you can maybe decide if you work on that or if you end the relationship, but it's you don't you don't have to cheat. You don't. You can choose to end the relationship and then go after the other, you know, then pursue the other person romantically. I like that on the show, sex is treated as just another aspect of adult life. It's not meaningless, but it's not what everything in the universe centers around. The adult characters on the show have sex, but they also work for a living, eat, talk to people. The sex shows how characters are feeling, how relationships are developing. And that brings us to episode six. You're, you're a winner. Ah, that might have been a slightly higher than her. I I thought that was great. Like she, you know, she gets on the phone and and does that message, and you know, it works. So let's see. Yeah, so we see the the yeah, Kilgrave has has the line Ossholes try. I just do. That's one way to quote Yoda. Now I want him to rephrase every quotable original trilogy Star Wars line. Not bad. But you're not a Jedi asshole. And we see Kilgrave hustle the other poker players. I preferred your brain on drugs and hope wants an abortion since the baby was conceived through rape she does want children long term but not like this this is extremely relevant since this episode aired the right wing were successful in their decades long campaign to overturn Roe v Wade and make abortion as close to as close to possible 
too entirely illegal in the US when this episode aired it was clear that they wouldn't stop until they got that so you know hopefully this episode did help some people realize it and you know now the fight is on let's see everybody quiet and they do kill grave creepy as usual and that wasn't Antoine on the phone Serena has proof Riva's death wasn't an accident and she is obviously concerned there's always someone who had it worse which is an excellent line to just you know obviously at, at this point she's not practicing self-care she is day drinking which is not healthy but it is something it is something important to remember I, th I think we all at times I'm not gonna claim that I'm above it can feel like you know oh why did this you know yeah the song why did this happen to me and it's important to remember you're not the only victim and yeah you know the the but yeah at the same time you also do have to practice self-care and Jessica doesn't want hope to be alone during the abortion and later we find out that actually because it was Jerry staying with her you know Kilgrave used the the ah, what's it called the the fetal remains to improve his powers so yeah and that's a, another great like Jerry wanted power more power for herself and in doing so she inadvertently made things worse for some other people and that is like I mean when the the when you know, today we know about climate change, but yeah, if you go back some decades, like, you know, <sighs> extracting oil, I'm not going to say that it always was evil, because people used to not know that, you know, exactly how bad it was, but there are countless cases where large companies have forced people to relocate just because that meant that the rich people that the company could get more oil that way or other natural resources so they did something evil and now we know that it you know it goes beyond them displacing people it actually worsened climate change it's i this is such a complex show i i love it I'm really, I'm, I'm really gonna miss it before I get to season two. But yeah, and helping Luke was supposed to make up for the pain I caused him, making amends. Not unlike a recovering alcoholic, another natural response to trauma. And Luke fights the the dogs and they're named Myers and Kruger the slasher icons very cool I like the fights at the pot growing place when the file told Luke that the bus driver was responsible for his wife's death I worried that the show would not have him learn that it was Jessica I was very relieved that she did come forward and tell him honestly the scene where she confesses to him might be the scene that got to me the most in all of the MCU projects so far I really appreciate it. it doesn't have the easy out of him forgiving her and he points out how she betrayed his confidence I, I want to say one of the lines was you let me be inside of you which is some you know now he has to live with that and yeah so the the uh, what's the word right on the tip of my tongue it's, 
Yeah, and you know, we see that the house that Kilgrave bought is where Jessica grew up. And that's why he won the money legally so you know, he yeah, he, yeah, he won the money you know, so he could legally buy it and the camera dollies out to reveal the street signs which are indeed the ones she says to go. And that brings us to episode seven, Top Shelf Perverts. And Jessica drank too much because of how upset she is about Luke hating her. You know, she drank at a bar near Wendy so that she could follow Wendy, get her signed the divorce papers. But she didn't have to drink that much. That was, you know, she could have just sat there for for hours and, you know, but she she drank a lot so that the the yeah to to cope with that, you know. Let's see, and the uh, what was the other thing? Yeah, and you know, Luke said, I was wrong, you are a piece of shit. And you know, a an unhoused person says, You smell like shit, and she says, Well, I'm a piece of shit, so of course. I don't love I mean it kind of it's a little bit of a of a joke, like a like a very sarcastic kind of joke, but the fact that it's an unhoused person telling Jessica that she stinks. You know, I, yeah, don't, not, not a, not a fan of that. And, you know, she goes after Wendy and like, she was just, she wasn't always going to go as far, but you know, she, she threatens to kill her using the subway car, drops her by accident, almost lets the train run over herself after saving Wendy, like seriously considering, you know, I, I get the feeling that she considers it because of Luke and she changes her mind because she still needs to save Hope. Now, the... And I, I can't help but wonder if that's a reference to Daredevil, the movie, which I guess... Yeah, it's, it's not a spoiler to say that there is something... There is also someone being threatened with death and and it's a subway train now yeah and and jessica gets in, into her bed and sees that kilgrave made reuben kill himself out of jealousy i i appreciate that like there there are some shows where because they can kill characters you know, they, they're allowed to show violence and such. They just have a lot of death, and sometimes it's kind of meaningless, and I, I have notes later in this file, but I just, yeah, I appreciate that no one just... Yeah, I'll get to it. But yeah, Jessica wants into a supermax to lure Kilgrave there, and we see Trish dom dominate Simpson sexually, probably working for some fear, and Simpson understands, so he doesn't object. You know, he's like, okay, this is not what I'm used to, and I'm maybe a little uncomfortable with it, but she needs to do this more than I need her to stop doing it. Now, let's see. And, you know, Trish found the bodyguard firm and wants Kilgrave to suffer in a cell for the rest of his life. And... Let's see. And Malcolm lies to Robin. You know, she, she figures out... She can tell that he's not telling the truth about the toothpaste, but he also doesn't tell her the truth. And Jessica confronts Trish's mom, and we realize that she knows where both of them are, and she's keeping 
Like, she doesn't want... As, as far as I can tell, she's keeping that information from both of them. Uh, you know, Trish... Trish thinks that Jessica's mom... Bleh, Trish thinks that her own mother is further away and... Uh, Dorothy, I think her name is. Dorothy thinks that Trish is further away as well. So, yeah. Because Jessica knows it would hurt Trish. And Kilgrave is making sure that Jessica's old house is just like it was when she was there. It, it just, it's getting creepier all the time. And Jessica slowly and wetly walks up to Clemens' desk with Ruben's cut off head. And Jerry won't put Jessica in Supermax because of Wendy. You still owe me a favor, goddammit. And Kilgrave used spies. He already knew she was arrested. Incredibly twisted how he has all the cops, train guns, on civilians themselves and such. So he knows that she won't try anything. And he gaslights her, claiming he hasn't been tormenting her. And he gets her to come home. He must have had people digging up the floorboards for hours until they found her journal. Because in the flashback, she's like, I don't, I don't remember which floorboard I buried under. And it's really sad to see that Trish and, her and Dorothy were not very welcoming to Jessica at first. Obviously, I'm not saying that I'm surprised that Dorothy wasn't. And that brings us to episode 8. WWJD, which in the episode is What Would Jessica Do? Instead of What Would Jesus Do? And we get more flashbacks and yeah and Jessica and Kilgrave try to set boundaries what were your happiest memories home a little appreciation wouldn't hurt and I I really love the you know Trish is worried about Jessica so Jessica on the phone I I didn't right down the line but it's some just unbelievably insulting things and and you know Kilgrave is like what is you know, don't you dare and then after saying all that she says he would never let me say that and he has to acknowledge that she's right I really love that she can insult him while technically not breaking the rule he set up because what he said was don't tell her that you and I are now together and she didn't. She specifically claimed that she's nowhere near Kilgrave because she wouldn't be saying that if he was around. And, you know, just he goes from just his head turning red. Like, he's, he's getting so annoyed. And finally she says, you know, he would never let me say that. And he's like, okay, yeah, fair enough. And Jessica has a nightmare about her dead family, revealing, you know, they died on that car ride. I really appreciate that Jessica refers to it as rape, since that's what it was. And he says, it can't be rape. I bought you expensive food, as if he bought her consent. And Kilgrave shows some of his childhood, including discovering his powers. And it is traumatizing. It doesn't excuse rape. Nothing does. But you can understand. You know, some, some people said they ended up having feeling sympathy for him. I don't know if I would go that far. But I definitely ended up understanding why he is the way he is. But he's done way too many evil things. I have empathy for Kevin. I do not have empathy for Kilgrave. And Kilgrave himself said, Kevin died in that room. You know, once he chose to do evil things, once he made the evil choice, he lost my sympathy. And Jessica pressures Kilgrave to do the hero thing, as he puts it. Jessica picked up on it being a Star Wars New Hope reference, too. And Jessica and Kilgrave debate Chuck's fate, and we see the drive and why Jessica blames herself, but she couldn't have known it would lead to their deaths. So she feels guilty of their deaths and survivor's guilt. You know, the two don't always go together. And Jessica realizes there is a chance that with her presence she could compel Kilgrave to be a hero. Has to go talk to Trish about it. 
and she does end up trying to do things her own way. She made sure there would be anesthetic in the food of the two people working in the house, other than Hank, but not hers, and not Kilgrave's, and then she intentionally spilt food on herself to have an excuse to get out of her seat. Clever. That was a really, like, she, you know, she came home to, I remember that you like uh, uh, Chinese food almost as much as you like uh, Italian, and, you know, she puts down, it's like, come eat with us, and, you know, and, and obviously he's like, you don't expect me to eat food that I didn't see what you did, and, and she's like, oh, fine, and she grabs her fork, sticks it in his food, takes a bite, see, I'm fine, you know, and then she, ah, oh, I spilled food on myself, so she gets, because if she just got out of her seat, he would be like, what's going on here, you know, and then the other two collapse, and yeah, it probably isn't the, the specific, like, the, the surgery grade uh, uh, anesthetic, it was probably just something simple, and yeah, I'm, I'm like, no, no, yeah, that that exists. I'm, I'm, I couldn't name you a specific thing, but there's definitely anesthetic that you can put in food, and it will work when you ingest it. And you know, because Jessica revealed about the bomb, you know, Kilgrave used it against Simpson and against the the nosy neighbor that, and he also he tried to give her some satisfaction in you know the nosy neighbor said a bunch of things that just weren't true and so Kilgrave said to her is that true and she says no it made me feel important what would you do if someone said that to you I'd want to slap them you know so that yeah you know I, I quite like that you know he he has tried buying her he has tried you know, we, we later find out that his powers don't work on her anymore. So so we can't do that. But he, you know, he tried buying her. He tried threatening her. You know, he tried appealing to nostalgia. And now he's trying to say, you know, oh, so this person that you didn't like when you were growing up, you know, let's, let's, I'm, I'm going to give you some catharsis in, in this situation to, to like, also, like, appeal to Jessica with, you know, he's doing for Jessica what he does for himself all the time. Just satisfying that, you know, yeah, they, they want to, the, yeah. That brings us to episode nine. There we go, Sinbin. And... Yeah, and we see that, you know, in the in the footage of, of Kevin, his parents asked him to smile. So that's, when, you know, and his child abuse might be why he showed such hatred toward the children of that family that he walked into the home of. You know, I, I realize that part of it is also, you know, he carelessly stepped on the toy of the, the boy. So that is, you know, part of, and, and then the boy said, that was my car. Which, you know, if Kilgrave still felt empathy, that would inspire some empathy. And maybe on some level he does feel a little, and he hates that. So he pushes it down and, and treats the boy even worse in, in response. He treats, he treated the, the two children worse than he treats a lot of the adults that we've seen him. So, yeah. I mean, it was completely gratuitous. He could have, he could have literally just said, don't talk. And that would have been that. He could have said that to both of the children, but no, he locks them in the closet, you know, just, yeah. Or, yeah, gets them to get in the closet and not come back out. Yeah. And Jessica uses electricity to hurt him and the video of Kevin and others. Good way to get him to admit I appreciate that, I realize, you know, that was several episodes ago, but this was when I thought of it. I appreciate that when they met, Jessica was wearing normal clothes, not anything remotely sexual. Otherwise, a bunch of misogynists would use that, make the absurd claim that she was asking for it.
Yeah, and, and Jessica talks to the other cop who says he needs evidence, so she needs him to confess on camera. And we find out, like, Jerry was just so awful to Wendy. Wendy paid for law school and, you know, all this. And, and now Jerry won't give her any money even though she's cheating on her. Just, yeah. And Kilgrave suggests to Jerry she, that he could take care of Wendy and later he does. And Pam holds some sexual power over Jerry. Unusual to see a woman do that to another woman. Yeah, I really appreciate that, you know, through the lesbian relationships, we actually see, because, you know, misogynists have said for a long time that women are worse than men. So here, you know, in, in various ways, they're not worth as much and they're, they're a lot meaner, which like for so long, women have owned almost nothing and have been treated really badly by men. Of course, some of them have become... Like, yeah, some women sometimes do wrong things. It's very frequently in response to what men have done to them. But yeah, in this ep you know, in on this show, we have you know this lesbian love triangle, and we see that the you know a woman, you know, the, the, yeah, the stereotype is that the man doesn't want the woman to get money even if he's the one cheating on her. Or if, you know, he's, in general, he's the one in the wrong. And here we see, you know, sometimes lesbian, you know, yeah. If it's a lesbian relationship, the it's entirely possible for one of them to be really cruel to the other. Being a woman doesn't make you above doing bad things it just you have to frame it in the right way because it's just yeah we have so much media where women are made out to be just awful to men and yeah it's yeah so let's see and and Kilgrave writes help me with his own blood on the glass and let's see. Yeah, and, and Jessica comes in goes in to talk to Kilgrave telling Jerry to shock if need be, and Trish does, but it's because Jessica almost killed Kilgrave. And let's see. Yeah, Hope talks to Jessica saying she'll take the deal. The character who faces the greatest current situation of hopelessness is named Hope. Just let that sink in. What does he want now? And Jessica recognizes Betty, Kevin's, yeah, Kilgrave's mother, and she confronts both parents. I wish I had a Mother of the Year award so I could bludgeon you with it. And we find out they actually helped Kilgrave for years. And... With Jerry already in the room of the cell, in comes Jessica, Kevin's parents, the cop, Trish, the professor, and Marianne. And someone cut the wire, and, like, it must have been Jerry. Good thing Trish emptied the gun, shooting the glass in Kilgrave. And Jessica saved Albert, but not Louise, and, yeah. That brings us to episode 10. 1,000 cuts. And... Let's see. So yeah, we get confirmation. It was Jerry who cut the wire. Trish putting a bullet in her head could so easily be goofy, but it's intensely creepy. And I, I like Jessica's solution. You know, she, she puts the bullet in her mouth and holds it so... There's a bullet in your head now, okay? And, you know, Kilgrave tells Jerry, take me to a doctor that you trust. And Jerry took Kilgrave to Wendy. That's, wow. Yeah, even, even in that situation. Like, she could, 
there's no way that Wendy's the only doctor that Jerry trusts. I'm a man of my word when I feel like it. Oh, shut the front door. Shut that door. Okay. And Wendy says hi, thinking it's Pam. So now Jessica knows Jerry is with Wendy. And Simpson kills the cop after pretending he won't. You know, he, he gets him to lower his guard and give the information. And then, yeah. And Malcolm is reluctant to help Robin. So she goes, if you're not a part of the solution, you're either gas or solid. And Pam realizes Jerry wanted Pam to kill Wendy. And yeah, Wendy, a major character, dies. A major character dies to quickly wrap up a plot line, and Hope's death is that too. One of my least favorite traits of Dexter, a show I overall continue to love. I haven't watched the new ones, so do not spoil those. I have the the new new blood, is that what it's called? I've only watched the original eight seasons, but those, you know, spoil away. I don't love old seasons equally. And I remember everything. Remembering everything doesn't mean know, knowing everything. And Robin gets the survivors group against Jessica, realizing that Malcolm lied. You're going to be okay. Say the goddamn words. I'm on meds. For a second there, I thought he was going to take yet another red pill. He's chucking them down like a whiny, pathetic man-child blaming his own problems on women. You can't say these trossy saucepots don't deserve... No, literally, it's hard to pronounce. And hope suicides, so Jessica will go ahead and kill Kilgrave. And that brings us to episode 11. I've got the blues. And we get some more... Flashbacks of Jessica was taken in by Dorothy for PR reasons. Poor teen Jessie in a hospital bed. She wants to get up but can't move. Feels like she's stuck in a groove. What the F was she trying to prove? So, in my opinion, Robin and Ruben started out as comic relief for those who don't love the snark and were too comical for the switch into being dramatic. The actors both do well, and I do appreciate trying to make that switch. I didn't see it coming. The car's getting used to blood. Did you buy Christine? I really love when Jessica tries to get Trish into the more mockingly singing the Patsy theme song. And Jessica refuses arrest, dozes off, sees who she thinks is Kilgrave, gets run over. I was surprised that it was just another person in purple. I thought it was just straight up a hallucination caused by the lack of sleep. And we see teen Jessica discover her powers, make a deal with Trish. And Jessica thinks that it was Kilgrave, not S Simpson, who burnt Clemens. We can't leave here without you, Simpson. Two red pills. And he double-double taps, taps, insists he'll kill Grave, kill... Kill, kill, Grave, Grave. There we go. Almost got it right. And Simpson put Jessica in the exercise room, so he was lying to Jessica... Dude broke off the knob. I'm guessing T Trish would like to do that right back to him. And Simpson was about to shoot Jessica, but puts the gun away. What doesn't kill us only makes a stranger. We already know how she got those scars. I mean, probably. Well, he'll find won't leave a scar, but... I'm not sure I love the part of the red pills where Simpson will occasionally repeat a word. I don't know, maybe it's like... Uh, a speed thing. Like she says that it's somewhat similar to speed. You don't look surprised. Whoops. So Jessica knows it was Simpson. Extremely tense when they have a super powered fight. Same for when Trish joins in. And another scene of Dorothy abusing young Trish. If you hadn't eaten all that pizza, we wouldn't have to do this. The camera adds 10 pounds. Stop eating fucking cameras! And Malcolm said, says he would commit suicide if he believed no one can help anyone. The show brings up suicide, death, and killing a lot, so I really appreciate it. it's almost never throwaway. Every time that 
nearly every time a person has died so far this season, it meant something, with a few exceptions. We knew who they were, what type of person they were. Even the guys who went to Simpson to bring him back to the program, we get a sense of who they are. You know, they, they're mocking Trish as if she's still Patsy and just, yeah. I think both of them had one or two lines each. And while we, like, uh, let's see. yeah, you know, we, we feel some empathy for them. We, we feel, yeah, we, we feel something. You know, fortunately, as already mentioned, the deaths of the characters of Wendy and Hope felt like they happened mainly to resolve those plot lines. But those are some of the only ones where it was like that. But yeah, I... I understand that I'm not supposed to like that they killed Hope, and I acknowledge that that's not necessarily the that the show's doing something wrong. It's giving me not what I want, but what I need. I wish that it wasn't how they resolved that, though. Like, hypothetically, she could have had, like, a sister that survived the, you know, the, the two... The, the parents dying, and, you know, she talks to, to Jessica for the episodes after Hope dies. I, I get that the fact that, you know, they spent a lot of time on Hope, and they had us really hoping that she would make it out. And then they take that away, which really hurts, you know, and it also tells Jessica, even if you try not to get involved, it will still hurt. People will get hurt. And you, you know, so, so you might as well do the right thing because it's going to hurt even if you try not to. But I don't love that. that yeah, my, my only real problem is that they resolve the plot line like that. And also that they, yeah, several of these deaths here near the end, it, feel like, it feels like they just kept those plot lines going to fill time. You know, others have pointed out, it feels like they should maybe have had only eight or nine episodes. Yeah, the eighth episode could easily have ended with them getting the the Kilgrave confession, him being put in Supermax, and that would be it. You know, the, the yeah, you know, maybe, maybe he's, like, he, he faces someone, and he's like, you have to get me out of here. I am the last surviving member of this important family and the other guy says and I'm Napoleon and then the camera reveals yes that is I am intentionally making a reference if you know you know if you don't I didn't spoil anything but yeah you know the the um, I, I I feel like that is probably what would have happened if it wasn't for the fact that they like to have 13 episode seasons you know yeah, I just I wish that they that they had managed to come up with something. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, it's the fact that they finish off those plot lines, which like, I mean, since they're not resolved by the end of the season, I do like those plot lines. I like the hope plot line. I like the you know the, the yeah the various stuff. The, yeah, involved in her plot line. And I like the the whole Wendy, Jerry, Pam situation, but for them to just have it end with, you know, a dramatic death scene and then that's it, you know, yeah, it just, it feels like that essentially was filler because it isn't resolved by the end, or rather it is resolved only through the death of one character that we were invested in, whereas you know, like, the the finale has Jessica, you know, now she kind of has to either choose to be a hero or, you know, pretend that people don't consider her a hero. Which, you know, before she was very careful to not, like, very few people knew that she had superpowers. And several of the people who knew, she intimidated. So it's not like they're, you know, they're not going to come knocking on her door talking about how they need her to help. They're terrified of her and they're too scared to tell anyone that she has superpowers. But now everyone has seen, you know, 
the, yeah, the cops saw her make the jump, which, I mean, I guess it's possible that that won't get, that not everyone will know about that. I th did she use her super strength when she was with Kilgrave? I'm not 100% certain of that, but certainly, you know, she, she is clearly, you know, someone who can, you know, she, she stopped Kilgrave even though all these other people were under his control and were, you know, all of, again, a dozen or two people, and they were all trying to kill each other, and they know that they didn't actually want to. It's him who made that happen. And here's this person who, you know, didn't, yeah, she, she could resist his control, and the, the, yeah, you know, yeah. An important aspect is also she forced, you know, she ha she got him to say stop, and she she specifically said, "I, you know, you've never died before. I don't know," thinks Jessica, "if you dying means that your control ends. What if it doesn't? So I had to get you to say stop to them. That's you know, she she risked a lot." She could ha he could have do done anything he wanted to her while she stands there asking him to stop to tell them to stop. So yeah. So so you know I'm I'm happy with and and Malcolm you know is gonna try to encourage Jessica to be a hero. You know Claire by the end of the finale knows about Jessica and has told Jessica that there's someone else out there. She didn't say Daredevil or his name is Matt Murdock, but you know. And, and Claire knows about Luke, and Luke leaves, not telling Jessica if he forgives her or not. When under Kilgrave's control, he said, I could never forgive you for that. Was that Kilgrave forcing him, or did he, you know, so there are, there are plots that build, and then you have Wendy and Hope dying, and there's just nothing, you know, so, yeah, I just, I don't like closing of uh, uh, I, I would I would rather have that Jerry ended up granting the divorce Wendy moved to another city and then we don't see her again that would be fine but killing off it's just it uh, yeah death ideally in fiction should not be uh, taken lightly you know also in real life should not be taken lightly but that is I mean even if you think that a death doesn't affect anyone it probably does you just aren't aware of the person it affects and you know and and Jessica gets to the bar right before it blows up Luke is on fire now also literally and we see when they were teenagers Jessica saved Trish from her abuse from Dorothy I believe it, it was definitely implied. I think they might have said it at least, but it wasn't explicitly shown before this episode. That's part of why Trish encouraged Jessica to be a superhero before Kilgrave, and why Jessica keeps going back and forth between being protective in tr of Trish and pretending she barely cares about her. Being protective is part of their relationship, but pretending she barely cares is how she tries to keep her safe from Kilgrave. And that brings us to the penultimate episode. That's such a wonderful word. Episode 12, Take a Bloody Number. And, yeah, in the bar at the start. It's kind of fun to see Kilgrave get annoyed at Luke, even though Kilgrave is technically in control. And Kilgrave got on the stage to see if everyone present would follow his commands. And since he's very upset, he gets angry at the guy who actually liked the performance. Very tense reunion in the hospital room between Dorothy and Trish. Malcolm leaves, doesn't want to be around. Jess again, later we do see he's still, you know, and and it's it's a good bit of writing that Jessica thought that Malcolm had left town, so that's why she doesn't call him and ask him to watch over Luke. And also the thing, you know, the, the, yeah, Luke 
says he forgives Jessica, and then Kilgrave says, you know, that, yeah, Jessica asks, you heard that? And he says, I wrote that. And he, yeah, he claims that all the things that Luke did that Jessica liked were actually him. And this is something people have been in abusive relationships deal with, feeling like the things that people do for them have been tainted by the abusive person. Now, let's see. And, yeah, Dorothy and Trish talk IGH, and like the last scene between them, Trish tells Dorothy, I would like for you to leave. I get the sense that is something she has rehearsed saying over the years, if her mother ever, ever came back. Breeders. And... Malcolm calms down the situation between Robin and the delivery person. Malcolm had some of Ruben's banana bread too. And it's it's such a great like you know the the ah what's the word? You know she thinks she she has gotten paranoid now too. And the delivery person is like this job sucks and that's yeah, a lot of delivery people are treated badly. It's not always by the people they're delivering something to. They they have very bad work conditions. I'm no good without him. No, you are plenty good and good and plenty. And Robin forgives Malcolm. I find the depiction of her grief very credible, and that's another thing very important to me: depiction of grief. And Kilgrave returns to the club. Still can't control Jessica. And then we have, you know, turns out he was still controlling Luke. Very tense fight between Luke and Jessica. And ends with Jessica shooting Luke in the head. And that brings us to the final episode, the finale. Smile. And, yeah, I love every episode of this season. It's, a, it's an excellent pilot. It's an excellent season and an excellent finale. So, yeah, I had guessed that this episode would probably kill Kilgrave, since this is the, you know, it, it would be very frustrating if it didn't. And, yeah, I appreciate it wrapping up something so important. Again, I've been very frustrated by some other shows that didn't, yeah. If he survives, it's because of you. Yeah, about that. And the needle can't break the skin, and Claire gets involved. The drill thing also can't break the skin. He saw one of those. And it's, yeah. You know, she let's see, she asks to get the police involved and a consult. Which, yeah, you know, makes sense that there would be this kind of... What's the word? The... the you know, yeah, when you have to deal with this this sort of thing. And Jessica picks up Luke like, uh, just, yeah. You're not my first now. Now who's got a revolving door? So yeah, this episode does spoil some details of Daredevil Season 1, but it leaves a lot of mystery still if you didn't watch it before watching this. And that's, you know, basically the idea is you watch... You know, if you didn't watch Daredevil, maybe you don't even know about Daredevil. You watch this uh, this entire season and the finale, you have know, Claire, and it's like, what is she talking about? And you Google it, and it's like, oh, Daredevil season one, also on Netflix, and now on Disney Plus, or yeah, now on Disney Plus instead. And it's, yeah, I I like you know Claire is like, I know. You, you know, don't, what? Don't feel guilt. Guilt makes people make terrible, makes shit decisions, something like that. You know, and, and it's important for you to acknowledge that this isn't your fault. And you know what? You can blame me if you want. Or, or some, or I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be guilty for you, or I'll feel guilty for you, or something. And so Jessica says, fine. This is entirely your fault. I, if, let's see, if he, if he dies, it'll be your fault, and I blame you for everything. Don't push it. And 
Jessica closes in on Kilgrave, chase involving a cop, and Kilgrave sends everyone in the hospital after Jessica, getting a real zombie movie vibe from them chasing her, and I am here for it. Same thing for when he controls a bunch of people at the, at the docks later. And yeah, to get out, Jessica dresses up as a doctor, but even so, pe some people still realize. I, I quite like, you know, she's walking there, she's got the, the mask on, and, she, you know, there's this girl with a broken nose walking next to her, and she's like, so, um, can't wait to kill this Jessica Jones, huh? And, you know, yeah, the the girl realizes, you're you're Jessica Jones, and you're saying that to hope that I think you're not. And... In the apartment building, Kevin has gone full villain, monologuing to himself about how he'll make Jessica suffer. That could very easily have been like, okay, we get it. Last time we see him, definitely want to make sure the audience hates him. I feel like it is consistent with this characterization, and this is, and and it does, you know, he he stand there thinking, what would make her suffer the most? And then when they're at the docks, he's like, I know. I will take Trish if you leave me alone, because that will hurt you more than if I have you. And I really love the part where, you know, she's like, I'll I'll say something I never say, like, I love you. And Trish is like, no, oh, that is true, you never do say that. And then, you know, tell me you love me. And Jessica leans to, to make, makes eye contact with Trish, I love you, you know, to make sure, no, 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 this is, I'm me. This is my decision. Claire gets creative to help Luke. Optic nerve. Yikes. I I really like, you know, at this point, Jessica still doesn't know. And I, I guess maybe she finds out. I'm guessing we'll find out in Luke Cage. Maybe even season one. Jessica still doesn't know. Why does Luke not want attention from the police? You know, what what is he worried about? You know? And, yeah. And Claire and Jessica talk Daredevil. And, let's see. Yeah, and Kevin is injected with the 40-60 chance. Kevin's dad is still alive, but only barely. And Malcolm and Claire talk about Luke. And, you know, Jessica tells Jerry that she's part of why Kilgrave is stronger, you know, and she needs Jerry to represent the the guy who, you know, the police are going to think this guy intentionally killed Albert, I want to say, Kilgrave's father, but he was under mind control. I guess is that supposed to be the thing of, like, no, technically hope still matters, even though she died. And I had guessed that it was Trish rather than it, Trish just dressed as Jessica rather than Jessica, but it's not like a long time passed between me realizing that and the show revealing it. Now, but yeah, it's it's a clever. Yeah, you know, she used to be an actress, so she can pretend to be someone else and yeah she she has earbuds blasting music so that she can't hear Kilgrave oh for God's sake it's Patsy I mean he didn't have to make a reference to because I I think the show was called it's Patsy and it's part of the theme song it's Patsy it's Patsy I want to be your friend now even I can't get it out of my head because, you know, Jessica imitated it in one episode and we heard it in another episode. So, yeah, they they did a good job coming up with something that would be really catchy. And they're shooting at Jessica, but not Trish, which means that Trish can also get some, yeah, epic shot of Jessica doing a control fall, as she put it, the, the jump. And Kevin makes a bunch of people at the dock attack each other, and Jessica snaps Kevin's neck in front of a lot of witnesses. 
and Jerry makes a really great defense of Jessica, and in voiceover, Jessica, you know, she says she, she isn't a hero deleting all these answering machine messages, but, you know, clearly it is wearing her down. She will, ev she will eventually have to... I, I don't know if she's going to be a full-on hero in Season 2, but clearly it's now something she has to reconsider. You know, now that Kilgrave is gone... And the, yeah, you know, she lost hope, or hope died, rather. The, yeah. Even when you lose hope, you can't lose hope. So, according to Wikipedia, the season addresses issues of rape and assault, and was always intended to be far more adult than other Marvel projects, particularly in terms of sex. Now, there is a stereotype that after being raped, survivors don't have sex because they have their relationship with sex completely ruined, but it does actually depend on the individual survivor, and some people actually find themselves increasing sexual activity. So I appreciate that this show acknowledges that for some it leads to continued sexual experiences, like it does with Jessica. And let's also note she spent an entire year believing Kilgrave was dead, so that may that time may have also helped her cope. And I have a few fellow critic quotes. In the end, everything comes back to the same plotting conflict between Jessica and Kilgrave and drags down too much of what surrounds it. I completely disagree. It is one of the strongest elements of the show. And then the, yeah, another critic said, The biggest thing you have to initially forgive Jessica Jones is the villain. Kilgrave is a brilliant monster, a wonderful antagonist, but his evil superpower is possibly the most overpowered in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Kilgrave can control minds with a simple suggestion he can make people do anything, and yet he seems to be content sexually torturing co-eds and making people kill their parents, rather than, say, taking over a country or conning Tony Stark out of all his money. This weighed, gr this weighed on me greatly in the early episodes. Seriously, it sounds like you just want a two-dimensional villain. Why doesn't he take over a country or get rich? Because he doesn't want to. He sees an attractive woman, wants her, uses his power to get her, gets bored, gets another woman. He's a pickup artist. Notice how the videos th those put out talk about getting with women, not taking over countries. Kilgrave would get bored with control of a country. He doesn't need money since he can just get people to give him the things money could buy. Thankfully, this reviewer does go on to say, much like Vincent D'Onofrio's sympathetic villain, sympathetic kingpin and daredevil revelations of the tragic origins of Kilgrave, coupled with the personal ramifications of his ability, eventually lead the audience to some understanding of his motives and actions, and at times, yeah, he says sympathy. I never felt sympathy for him. Not Kilgrave, but Kevin. Let's see... Right, and another critic says, you know, the, in the all-important battle between Jessica and Kilgrave, we find another significant weakness in his first season, because as he is repeatedly captured, then set free in a succession of increasingly ridiculous plot contrivances, it all starts to get a little frustrating. Let's see... The other reason this show has been getting a lot of attention is that it, this, is that this is one of Marvel's first superpower women, and aside from Agent Carter, it's the only show really built around a female character. While that show was often accused of being rather heavy-handed in its attempts to convey a feminist message, Jessica Jones has no such problem. Jessica is a complex character whose femininity is only one aspect of that, but it is an aspect rather ju than just treating her exactly the same as a male hero. The show deals seriously with women's issues like rape, abortion, stalkers, as well as more universal psychological problems like PTSD and the importance of therapy and support to overcome it. It also features one of the few openly gay characters we've seen in the MCU to date. I'm not entirely sure why they say one of when rather than three of, but whatever. The show isn't afraid to explore dark themes of sexual assault, rape, and abortion, and it does so with taste. The victims are not shown being raped. The viewer is just expected to believe them without titillating rape scenes to prove the facts, which I really, really appreciate. That There are way too many rape scenes in way too much media. Just, yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, 
showrunner Melissa Rosenberg had initially expected to be inundated with fewer complaints about the abortion issue in episode aka You're a Winner, season 1, episode 6, but instead was horrified to receive scathing condemnation for the series' portrayal of a sexual relationship between a white woman and a black man, Jessica Jones, and Luke Cage. Rosenberg recounted to The Hollywood Reporter's Lacey Rose that her picture even ended up on a hate site that targeted her because she is Jewish, which she said was a particularly scary moment for her. It's... I know that people who do things like that are not going to listen to me, but let me say to people near them, if you have any empathy, even if you hate the idea of interracial relationships, even if you, you know, the, the thing with Jews, there, that was one of the, it's, it's an anti-Semitic trope and uh, an anti-Semitic idea that the Jews control the media and try to weaken the white race by getting black people to have children with white women. And yeah, it's just, it's so unbelievably hateful. And if you believe it, just... There are people I hate. There are groups of people I hate. I think reactionaries are disgusting. And I would still not want violence upon, I would not vi wish violence upon them. And yeah, the, the, I am careful to not ever suggest that violence would be, you know, it, violence solves almost nothing. You use ideas to combat other ideas. And, you know, I, yeah, try not to use hateful ideas. Just, if, if you don't think that the, yeah. Now, let's see. But yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I hope that she hasn't ended, that Rosenberg hasn't ended up regretting it, because I do think that there are some incredibly important ideas expressed and explored here, and there, it's almost always done with a lot of taste. So, yeah, I, I hope that it didn't make her re regret it, but, yeah. Now... Let's see, season, uh, rather, episode, let's see, episode eight. Yeah, the show could easily have ended at the end of episode eight. You know, when, when she, the, the, um, yeah, I, and I don't think it really bothered me until then when he got released. Let's see, there was the, she came close, but then had to deal with Officer Simpson. And then later, they got him, but he had bodyguards. And, the, the, you know, that's how he got free again. Yeah, honestly, the, the only time it really bothered me was episode 9. The, the thing with... Yeah, you know, honestly, I think that if the... If they had been asked, do you want to do eight episodes or 13 episodes, I think the showrunners would have said eight episodes and the, yeah, you know, that, that would have been perfectly fine and yeah, you know, the, the, the episode ends with Jessica capturing him, getting a confession out of him. That is accepted. We see Hope being released from jail. We see Wendy sign the divorce papers. And let's see. Yeah, you know, th things like that. Well, okay, let's see. Well, if Wendy just signed the divorce papers, she would lose a lot. Okay, yeah, we, we see Jerry finally agree to, to give her the. Yeah. Let's see, and yeah, honestly, episodes 10, 11, 12, and 13, 
you know, I, I enjoyed all these episodes, but, you know, okay, so they don't really fit the dictionary definition of filler episode because important stuff happens, it features major characters and main characters, but, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe filler isn't the right term, but they didn't really need to be there. I, I appreciate that episode 9 does give, or, give us some more background on Kilgrave or Kevin, but... If they only had eight episodes, they could have taken time from the subplot with Jerry and had that, you know, yeah, and, and even, like, you could still have Jessica be, you know, revealed as a hero at the end of episode eight, like the, the, let's see, yeah, you know, there's the part where she uses the the drug to to put put him to sleep so that she you know the the let's see the yeah you could easily work in that before she does that he has a bunch of people you know yeah in, instead of how it happens in the episode now he has a bunch of people that all you know, have been, he's told them at, to attack each other, so they do, and she tells him, tell them to stop, and so he does, and she tranks him, and then, you know, gets the confession out of him, and they contact her, and she, you know, considers her a hero, that kind of thing, yeah, but again, I do think interesting things happened, let's see, so yeah, a Kilgrave gaslighted Jessica, controlled her completely, took away her ability to withhold consent. In the real world, there are no men with mind control powers, but there are many men who do the things that he does with emotional manipulation, pressure, threats, and the like. So it, it is an extremely relevant story to tell. Let's see. Yeah, so I have seen some people say that Jessica Jones is unlikable, bland, dry, you know, Jessica Jones, the traumatized rape survivor who has PTSD. If you can't empathize, empathize with someone like that, I implore you, work on that part of yourself. People like that exist in the real world, and they deserve our empathy. Also, why are so many female leads called unlikable for traits and actions that male leads are considered complex for? Breaking Bad, Sopranos, Game of Thrones, Dexter, Mad Men, probably others have male leads like that. And I would say that Jessica Jones, the show, does that for Jessica Jones, the character, at least in season one, I hope. Also season two and three, haven't watched them yet. In this season, Jessica is not a role model, and she's not trying to be. She's been dealt a bad hand, her family dying. She has a responsibility to stop Kilgrave since she knows his power, and if it takes some rotten behavior, such as using Malcolm to get meds that can disable Kevin's power, tricking Jack's mom into thinking that she can get them, you know, get the get the ruling overturned, maybe get them some money to support them. And if she sometimes fails when doing her best, at least she's trying. Love to see it in a female protagonist. Again, tons of male leads are allowed to be that complex. You know, that's a, you know, she is, I think I did see someone say she was a Mary Sue, which is like, you do not know what those words mean. You, you have no idea, because that is in no way what she, like, you know, what, that was one of the things. I, I read a, a review where someone pointed out she's allowed to sometimes fail, even when she, like, she does her best. She's, she's, it's not that, like, oh, she, you know, someone else made her fail. No, she made a mistake. She, she makes mistakes across the season and it makes things worse, but she doesn't let that, you know, knock her down because that's the thing. At the end of the day, like, it is impossible to go through life without making mistakes. All of us are going to make mistakes. And the, you know, what, the, the thing is, how do you deal with that? Do you, do, do, you know, does it mean that you stop trying? Or does it mean that you become even more determined to, to keep going? And you, and you try to learn from that mistake and not make that mistake again. So the entire show on IMDb has 7.9 out of 10 based on 212,794 IMDb user votes. 
29.7% gave it an 8, 21.4, a 9, 17.6 gave it a 10, 17.3 gave it a 7, 6.7 gave it a 6, and everything else, yeah, 2.8% gave it a 5. 1.8% gave it a 1. Wow, I do not understand hating everything in the show that much. Anyway, 1.3% gave it a 4, and less than 1% gave it a 3 and a 2. More than 1% combined, but individually less. And on Metacritic, the... F uh, what? Oh, that's right, they don't... Yeah, the entire show has gotten a 68 out of 10, based on 113 ratings, 80 positive, 10 mixed, 23 negative. Okay. And there are a total of 13 user reviews. And only, let's see, only one of them has spoilers. And it's in German, so if you can't speak German, it's not going to spoil anything. And there's one that's in Fran Fra France, French. But the remaining 11 are in, Eng <laughs> well, 10 of them are in English, and one of them is wordless. I didn't know you could even do that on Metacritic. I thought there was a minimum limit. Anyway, yeah. And... Let's see, is this also only... Yeah, yeah. The entire show has a 76 out of 100 on Metacritic, based on Critic. Yeah, the other one was Users. I forget if I mentioned that. 47 positive, 11 mixed, and 0 negative. And as far as Season 1 reviews go, there are 32 out of... Oops. Ah, crap. Like this. 57 total reviews. And on Rotten Tomatoes, I can't actually see based on just seasons. So there are. Let's see. Yeah. Season one, the critics' consensus is Jessica Jones builds a multifaceted drama around its engaging anti-hero, delivering what might be Marvel's strongest TV franchise to date. Now, I haven't watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or the other, you know, uh, Agent Carter. You know, I have, yeah, some of them I haven't watched, so I can only compare it to Daredevil Season 1, but it's definitely, to me, it, it tops Daredevil Season 1, which I still think is amazing. I, both of them are 10 out of 10. Not because they're flawless, but because their strengths so greatly outweigh their weaknesses. Now, it has a 94% on the tomato meter. And, yeah, 80 reviews total. Only five of them are rotten. And the average rating is 8.20 out of 10. And the audience score is 86%. Average rating of 4.1 out of 5. 346 ratings. And yeah, that means that it is certified fresh. And that is absolutely everything I had for Season 1. I'm really going to miss the show, but I am also really psyched. So, so let's see, that means tomorrow I watch... Season 2, Episode 1 of Daredevil, and I am really psyched. I, yeah, I am really, really glad I decided to do this. These are, these are, I, I want to make clear, I never thought they were bad. I've heard that Season 1 of Iron Fist, and some say both seasons of Iron Fist, is average or bad, and I've heard a number of people say that The Defenders is average or even bad, but... Outside of that, you know, I knew that these were great shows. I've, you know, I've heard people talking about them since 2015. So, yeah. I don't like everything that the House of Mouse, Lord Mickey does. 
but I'm really glad that I did not have to get Netflix to watch the show because it would probably have been several more years. I am, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get Netflix. You know, for, for a while it was like, well, I guess I eventually have to get it because some MCU stuff is on there, but now not so much. Although I feel like there's at least one or two things. Yeah, I'm not particularly interested in Stranger Things. It's just not my kind of thing. That's all. You know, I I didn't like the the kind of like there's a there's a reference to E.T. There's references to like Stephen King stuff set in the 80s. Uh, I'm not that or, or made in the 80s. I wasn't that into it when that was the things. I'm I'm not the the. It, I'm not the target audience, and that's great. I'm glad that shows are being made for people who aren't me, who have completely different tastes. Because, you know, I hear that it's a great show. So, yeah, I'm glad for the people that, yeah. But the, let's see, was the, I feel like the second, what was it called, Cloverfield Lane? Um, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Is that on Netflix? Let's see. Oh, that was the, the, Clo the Cloverfield Paradox is on Netflix. Not sure I'm that psyched about that one, but yeah, if, if 10 Cloverfield Lane, I might have to watch that because Prey was incredible. I want to watch more Dan Trachtenberg. He also directed Black Mirror, The Boys, The Lost Sim Yeah. Anyway, the, the, um, yeah. So, two weeks from now, I will let you know what I thought about Daredevil Season 2. And one week from now, if everything works out, one, let's see, one week from now, yeah, it will prob- Ah, actually, never mind. One week from now, a movie not a show but i want to make sure yeah i'm i'm not 100% set on which movie it will be yet but yeah so i hope you enjoyed watching as i enjoyed watching the recording and i will catch you next time